When I, when I look at, and I think about Mother's Day, and I think about women, all women, the, the strength of women, I, I think always about the resurrection day or the uh, crucifixion day of our Lord Jesus Christ. How when Jesus Christ was on that cross, all the disciples were watching? No, I don't think so. The disciples, those men, were scared. They ran at the garden, and there was only one that showed up. His name was John, but all the women were at the crucifixion. When the men were scared silly, they were nowhere to be seen, but no, all the women were there when Jesus Christ needed them most. Who was there? The women. I encourage you, just type in women. Type in. You know, on the day of Jesus' resurrection, on the day where Jesus rose from the grave, on that day, who were there? Who was the first ones there? You know it. Type it in. The women. Guess where the men were? They were shut in behind doors, locked doors. They made sure the shutters were locked, and they isolated themselves. They were in quarantine-like. They, they literally did not want to be there at the resurrection. They were clueless because fear gripped their hearts so strongly that they missed probably the most, and it was the most important thing of earth's existence. The resurrection power of Jesus Christ bursted out of that grave. And who was the first ones there? Women, not the men. They were scared. They were fearful. They were behind locked doors and windows. Those men, they were shaking in their boots. When I think about the women in this way, I, I've learned one thing about women. They are fearless. They are bold. They are willing to go where angels fear to tread. You've heard that saying. There is something about women that you're not going to hold me back. But this is the other negative about women. We know of a woman named Eve that got us into a little bit of a mess here. See, women have such an incredible boldness, such an incredible, like, fearlessness. It's, I love it. I love seeing that. But when it's not channeled and directed correctly, ooh, I've seen it mess up marriages. I've seen it mess up families. I've seen it mess up a lot of things. Stephanie's behind me going, preach it, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. I've seen it mess up a lot of things. There was a woman that had the incredible honor, incredible reward because she followed God. She followed Jesus Christ when Jesus was upon the earth. Her name was Mary Magdalene. And this woman, the Bible says in Mark 16, 9, was the very first one to see Jesus. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Now, there were some other women with her, but he appeared first. It made it very strong there in Mark 16, 9. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. Can you imagine seven demons being cast out? I can't even imagine having one demon. Now, my mom told me I had a demon in me every once in a while when I was a kid growing up. 
My wife thinks I have a demon. That's another story in itself. But seven demons. She had seven demons in her. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was uh, the lust of sex, the lust of greed. Uh, I I don't know. But there were seven demons in Mary Magdalene, and they were Jesus cast all seven out of her. And, and so she was the first one because she followed Jesus. That's the difference between a Christ follower and I call a Christian. You know, when the days of old, back 50 years ago, back 40 years ago even, when you would say Christian, that meant something. It doesn't mean a lot today because 80% of America says they're Christian, but they don't follow Jesus. She was a Christ follower. She knew how to follow the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on the earth and even afterwards. That's why she was at the cross. She followed Jesus because why? He did something in her life. When Jesus does something in your life, when he restores something in your life that the devil took and and stripped you and and wrecked you and messed you up, you want to follow that person that just literally incredibly healed you and did a miracle within you. I'll never forget when my mom prayed for me at 22 years of age and I was a prodigal son and basically I was in the pig pen like that prodigal son that Jesus Christ talked about. And when I came back to Jesus Christ, when I finally came back, he restored so many things in my life. I literally said, God, I give my whole life to you. And that's why I went went into the ministry. Mary Magdalene, God, Jesus Christ restored her. And so she says, I will follow you until I die. And that's what she did. She was at the cross and didn't care what the soldiers said when the men, when the men were scared silly. And when she followed Jesus Christ, she wanted to be there. And she was there probably every day after, after he was in that tomb. And she went on that third day. And man, she got honored because she was the first one to see Jesus. She was the first one that Jesus finally appeared to, and something, something mighty happened. Matthew 28, 9 says, And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they ran to him and grasped his feet and worshiped him. See, she loved Jesus so much. She was a follower of Jesus Christ so much that she wanted to lay things at his feet. She was willing to just grasp his feet. Do you realize, I'm not gonna totally do this, but do you realize, I don't know if the cameras can get down, but when you grasp somebody's feet, I mean, you're literally bowing down. You have to lay everything, your whole body down to grasp his feet. You are at the lowest point you can possibly go. She humbled herself before Jesus Christ. She grasped her feet, his feet. Because even before that, she laid it all at his feet. And so she knew where to worship because she had to be at the lowest point possible. She humbled herself before God. Our Lord Jesus Christ has done so much for us and she knew that. She humbled herself. She was at his feet. She grasped it. We have a beautiful lady, Yolanda, that I want Tammy. Tammy, go ahead and introduce. Yolanda has been a part of our congregation for about eight years now, which is so hard to believe. And she's a quiet one, but it's so evident and always has been, that she is a true follower of Jesus. And I I think of the story of Mary, how she witnessed the resurrection of Christ. But more than that, she experienced the resurrection of Christ. There was so much that had died in her life that Jesus resurrected for her. And 
that I think that's such a beautiful picture of your life. As and it's so interesting because we've never really had a conversation about this, but I picked up on some tidbits that you put out there in the chat online a couple of weeks ago, and I was just so intrigued with your story. Real, you know, we come into church and we see one another, and we have no idea the history behind what Jesus has done because the transformation is so great. And so we just wanted you to come this morning and just share with the people the resurrection that has taken place in your life because you were willing to lay that down at his feet. Well, I had a pretty troubling um, background. i very rebellious. Uh, I did drugs and alcohol and um, also had children out of wedlock. Um, and so with all of those things, there's a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of um, fighting. Um, you know, every day, you know, I, and it's, it's funny how you can repeat the same things, it, even though you're sick of it, but that's all you know. That was my identity. And so, you know, you get in this trap, and I know one day I looked at the little faces of my children, and uh, I said, no, this is not the way it's supposed to be. I knew things had to change, but I was scared of that change. But the change was very appealing, and I just started crying out to God. Um, you know, the, the Lord did some amazing things. Uh, he brought, I lived out in a remote area. I didn't think anyone knew I was out there. But, you know, I was there by myself with the kids. Um, at the time, my husband now was my boyfriend. And so, you know, just, I would cry at times, knowing that this, is, this wasn't the life I was supposed to live. And, and I would know, I would look forward for him to coming home, but yet at the same time, I knew, you know, we would, you know, start drinking, getting high, and then fighting would start. And that was our family. And I, I knew our life wasn't meant to be that way. So he brought out, the Lord brought out a Jehovah's Witness. And I, I, imagine, it, I remember that day um, because I told her, you know, you came at the time I needed someone most. I didn't understand that this was not a faith I had followed, but he used her. And I told her, you know, I'm, I'm considering changing my life. I don't know what to do. I'm scared. Um, this is what I'm dealing with. And she listened. And so shortly after that, um, you know, she visited, you know, weekly. She came by, and, and um, I enjoyed our, our, our you know, uh, time of her uh, ministering to me, reading the Bible, and, and I was being encouraged and strengthened. And then shortly after that, um, I made a decision that we had to separate because um, I wanted to change my lifestyle, and he wasn't ready for that. And so... Again, I thought about my children. They didn't ask to come into this world. I, I knew that their perception of the world would be what they would see in this nuclear family. And if that wasn't healthy, their likelihood of stepping out into the world would be very ugly. And I didn't want that for them. And so, um, you know, as we separated and, you know, I got a place, the Lord, I got into my work. Um, started working again, and the Lord brought in a very, a wonderful gentleman, 15 years older than I was, but he was a great man in the Lord, and one day he was ministering to me. Um, you know, I told him, yeah, you know, I was still kind of, you know, at the time I was taking some, you know, advice from my friends, and oh, let's go meet some, you know, meet some men, you know, have you get cheered up and everything, and so, um, but then I was drinking, even though I didn't feel the greatest about doing that or meeting the people. I wasn't really ready, but I was wanting to do something different. And so, um, and I was still, you know, uh, experimenting with, you know, getting high. The, the familiar things, even though the, the environment changed, my ways were still there. My old ways were still there. And so my, my mentor, my spiritual mentor, his name is Dennis, I love him. He's just the greatest man. We cried together. We laughed together. And I got angry with him when he would tell me the truth. But he says, you know what? Uh, when he would give me the truth, he would say, you know what? I'll let the Holy Spirit work on, on you. 
And, you know, I'd go to work, and I'd come back and say, you know what, I think I know what the Lord was telling you to tell me, and I receive it. But I remember one day my friend says, you know, you're, you're getting, you're still doing the things you're doing, you know, how, how do you read the word? How do you know that you're, you're getting everything he has for you because you're under the influence? And he asked me, how much does it mean to you to get high or drink? I says, well, I don't do it that much. He says, well, then it should be nothing to get rid of it. That was a slap in the face. I'm like, yeah, I think I could get free from this. It was, it was all I could say, the Lord put things, the, the people in my life, he put situations in my life that really humbled me, and I was reconciled to the Father. Awesome. Isn't it interesting that the Lord used a doctrine that may not have been entirely sound to capture your heart and get you starting to think in the direction of following him. The Lord can use anything, can That's he? Right. And so is, I'm encouraged that it took you 15 years. Is that what you said? 15 years from the time you started realizing you needed to make some changes before you actually really got on track? Um, well, no. Um, so he and I lived together. I mean, so, you know, I, I started at a very young age of doing, you know, drinking and getting high. I mean, I was probably 14, 15 years old. So, well, uh, around 28 is when I gave those things up. Hmm. So it's been almost 20 years that I've been sober. Pretty So good. great. And so you're married? You married? Yes. So, yeah. So since we were separated, my same friend, Dennis, you know, he would encourage me at times, you know, because their dad and I, we would talk and we, a lot of times we would get, it, you know, in fights on the phone, but he was always pursuing our family getting back together. And I would be tough and say, no, you're not the right person for me. But at the, you know, at the same time, neither one of us were, we both were single. We didn't like going out there, meeting different people. And again, my, my friend says, you know, if you get with someone else, you don't know what you're gonna get. Because the Lord has given you eight years to, to help you heal, to make you stronger, to make you, you know, a, a person that can handle these things. And I said, you're right. And so, um, you know, one day he called and I decided, let's, let's talk. And it was a matter of three months after we started seeing each other again that um, we decided to get our family back together. You know, but I was a little, you know, I was fearful, I, I will admit that wasn't sure if we were equally yoked. Um, but my friend, he, he mentioned that, if, you know, if he's willing to let you go to church and worship your God mm -hmm. and not hold you back, you know, you have your children, God will make it work. And he has. Amen. He has. He's a good man. Amen. And so there's always hope, even when we're separated and it looks like there's no hope. You have so much to your story. I, th I know there's even a, a beautiful testimony of the birth of your son, how the Lord sustained him, because he wasn't he a preemie? He was 26 weeks, yeah. Yeah, so wow, the Lord has just blessed you over yeah. and over in your life. Amen. Give it up for Yolanda. Awesome job. Awesome job. She finally got to that place, Yolanda. Yeah, I can lay my drugs down. I, I can <laughs> grasp Jesus' feet. I can lay it down at his feet. I can lay my alcohol down at his feet. You know, a lot of times, people just need to get that out of their house. You know, because when it's in the house, it's saying, drink me, take me. Right. You know, and that's always the first step. Sometimes when people come to me and say, well, I, I, I just bought it. I don't, you know, it cost me a lot. No, 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 no. Empty it all out. Just empty it down the drain. Get it out whatever it takes. She was able to lay it down at Jesus' feet, and man, you've been hanging on at Jesus' feet ever since. You've been a Christ follower. That's right. There's no going back. <laughs> amen. Amen. I love it. I love it. Have you ever, do you ever remember, and I'm sure every sibling has remembered at one time, you getting in a fight with your sibling? Oh, I remember right now uh, my sister yelling at me because I was not, I hate when my sister used to mother me. And she, I wasn't doing what she wanted me to do. Just, 
whatever it was. And I remember her yelling, Mom, Mom, Jeff, make Jeff do this for me. Make Jeff, he's not helping me with this. Yeah, in fact, that voice was just like that. Mom. <laughs> I love it. She can't say anything right back to me right now, so it's all, it's all about me. It's all what I say. And so I, what I love, there is a, two sisters in the Bible that we're having a problem here. And one name is Martha and one is Mary. And I, I love this story. I love this story. I, I, my wife now, she, should I tell you who she tends to be? Well, I won't tell you uh, who she tends to be. But I love this story because I love telling my wife every once in a while about this story. I love telling my mom every once in a while about this story, okay? But here... Luke 10, 39, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet. Type it in, Lord's feet. Listening to what he had said. But Mary was distracted. Type in there, distracted. Now, let's talk about what Mary was distracted all about. She was distracted by all the preparations. Now, this is what I love about <clears throat> My sister, my sister is a, a woman that just goes with the flow. Her husband's probably not agreeing right now with that, but she's just a woman that goes with the flow. She's just, hey, come on over. Uh, and she doesn't care what's in the refrigerator. She just loves fellowship and goes with the flow. Now, she would be sitting at Jesus' feet without a doubt. But Martha was distracted by what? by all the preparations that had to be made. Now, maybe I could put in there, Shirley was distracted. Uh, I won't put Tammy in there, but you know what? You get what I'm saying. Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had been made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. <laughs> now, we're, we're talking about siblings here, so we're going to, siblings talk to each other different. Jesus said this, Martha, Martha, I love this, Martha, Martha, you are worried. You're upset. And he added in there about many things, many things, but only one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And she chose to sit at his feet. Mary wasn't distracted. Mary wasn't worried. Mary wasn't concerned about anything. She didn't care if those disciples, those, those dirty, fish-smelling disciples got fed or not. She's like, you're on your own. I'm going to sit at Jesus' feet. Because down deep in Mary's heart, she knew he wasn't going to be with them long. See, a woman knows things, especially a mama. They know things. They got eyes on the back of their head. I know. My mom has eyes on the back of her head. When I was a little kid and I was trying to do things behind her back, she was, Jeffrey, I'm like, how did you know? She just knew. She'd be doing dishes or, I mean, she was, Jeff, I just know. Women know. And she knew that it wouldn't be long. And somehow, some way, Jesus was going to be gone. Because also, Jesus was telling them, the men, were, they, weren't, they weren't getting it. But the women that followed Jesus, they got it. And they, she knew in her heart, she wasn't distracted. She wasn't concerned. Nothing was freaking her out. Why? Because she laid it all at Jesus' feet. Another beautiful lady that's behind me that I like for Tammy to introduce. This is Layla. 
and she's been a part of our Gateway family for about five years. And uh, Layla had talked to me just a few weeks ago and just said, you know, the Lord is just really stirring my heart to share my story. And I said, you know, let's just pray about that. He's going to show us the right time. And we, we kind of had considered a couple of options of where your story could be shared, but we just weren't feeling like that was the timing. And all of a sudden, today opened up, and I said, that's it. Let's do it. So she's, this is, this is the first time she's actually shared this story publicly, and I'm sure it's not going to be easy, but I really believe that there are women out there that can relate, and um, it has a beautiful ending, and so would you just share with us what you had shared with me, because I know that there are some women that will really be touched as they hear how the Lord has brought transformation to your life. I will do my best. <laughs> so uh, in my 20s, it was a very dark time in my life. I was very lost. I was a very different person than I am today. And I was married to a man that was a few years older than me. He was very abusive, uh, very unfaithful, and I was just obedient. I kept it safe. I was in survival mode. And I became pregnant. I did not have any godly influences around me. My parents were not in my life, and he wanted me to get an abortion, and I did. I was very numb. I didn't feel pregnant. There was no emotion. And even that day, they would give me a Valium to relax me. But it brought me to a point where it was a blur. I didn't feel any emotion until I was on that table, and I was screaming for them to stop. But I think it was to a point where they couldn't. That day, I would sob and cry. My husband would go to the bar, and then he would call me from a bar stool that night to tell me one day we would have a baby. And I was crushed. And for 15 years, I would not think about it. I buried it so deep. Um, I would eventually leave him, and I would meet my next husband, because I was still very broken and did not know the Lord. And I would have two miscarriages. And because I did not know the Lord, I really thought he was punishing me for what I had done and to look back, I still don't know what year it was. I don't know how old I was. I think I was 22, 23. I had other women tell me, you need an abortion. You're not ready to be a mom. No one told me to keep my baby. And so I, I thought he was punishing me until I became pregnant again. And I had Jonathan. And we have an amazing amazing relationship. He is my little cuddle bug, and I know the Lord now. He took me at a time, a low time for myself. I was um, struggling with a lot of pain, and I was at home. I was alone. I was in a lot of pain, and he showed me a video on Facebook. Alveda King is very pro-life. She's Martin Luther King's niece, and she shared a video of what happens and something was pulling me. I know now it was the Holy Spirit saying, you need to watch this. And I did. And I laid it all down at his feet. And I wailed and I cried and I apologized. And he put his arms around me. He said, it's okay. I love you. Your baby is safe with me. You will see them again one day. And you're my daughter. And I knew you would do these things. And I waited for you. And um, since then, uh, now I can't forget about it. But there's a sadness in my heart. But he's taken away the shame because he's going to do something beautiful with it. He's already given me a beautiful life, a beautiful church family. He's taken things away from me and my health. He blesses me time and time again. And... Uh, He's, he's brought me out of a really dark time in my life. 
So, yeah. That's so good, Leela, because we will, as mamas, always have moments of sadness, but mm -hmm. the Lord does take our shame and condemnation. And it's really obvious that you have such a special relationship with Jonathan, and I think you, <laughs> uh, you appreciate your role as a mom so much more because of what you've been through. Yeah. And I believe you're a voice of encouragement today to other women that either have made that same choice unknowingly or maybe are considering it and needed to hear today that that's not the right choice. So yes. thank you for sharing that. Sure. It's awesome. Man, let's give it up for Layla. Wow. Awesome. Awesome how she laid it at Jesus' feet. Laid it at Jesus' feet. And, you know, there are so many ladies, so many women like you were, they were following a lie, living in a lie. And... Um, I'll never forget October 4th, you, get, you came to Gateway, right? Is that when you gave your heart to the Lord, or was it before? Okay, but you came to Gateway October 4th, and um, God, or the devil, about uh, 22 years ago, tried to do something really bad in our church, and in my, in our, in my life as a pastor, um, and a huge group of people, when I first came here 22 years ago, came against me, and it was on October 1st, 4th, when they came against me. And so I shared that about five years ago, and then Layla came up to me afterwards and said, well, now um, hopefully I'm a good memory that I've come to Gateway on October 4th. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I tell you, you better believe it's a good memory. Um, my wife... Um, Someone gave this to my wife, um, and I don't. I don't think uh, she never uses it. I don't think she'll. Didn't I? Didn't ask her. I don't think she'll mind. I'm not even going to turn around. But it's Chanel number no. five, and um, someone gave this, and I. I. I think this might be a little expensive, but I know she's not using it, so I just figured I'm just going to dump it all out. And because, whoo, is it smelling good, Pastor Paul, right here? Woo-hoo. Man, dump it all out. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's Chanel. I, I have no idea how much this is. I'm sure maybe it's been 40 bucks, maybe. But um, I don't know if anybody's responding, uh, if you hate me right now. Um, because Chanel number five, Chanel number five, <laughs> I found out it's over a $200 little bottle like this. I'm pulling your leg. Nobody gave it to my wife. And this is not Chanel number no. five. That was grape juice in there that I just poured out. But some of you reacted. How can you? Dare? How dare you, Pastor, pour your wife's perfume out? Well, it's not my wife. There's... Believe me, she's not in the high f fancy stuff like that. I just found out this last week that's like over two hundred dollars for that little bottle, <laughs> Chanel number no. five. There is a woman that was a very sinful woman in the town that Jesus was visiting. That finally, when he was visiting at the table with some people and with some Pharisees and his disciples were there and all that, and they were having dinner. This sinful woman runs in with an alabaster box, breaks it open, and anoints Jesus' feet. Some of you might say, what's the big deal? That alabaster box costs a year's wages in that day. One year's wages. Take the average year wages in your area. That's what that box cost. Can you imagine? She laid it at his feet. She didn't care about what it cost. She didn't care of the price tag that was on it. She didn't care how valuable it was. She just knew that Jesus Christ did a miracle in her life. And she fell at his feet. And she came up behind him, grabbed his feet, grasped his feet, 
poured, broke open the alabaster box, and, and they knew it was brand new as she broke it open. And she started to weep. She started to cry. In the beginning, when I was talking about my mom, a memory flooded my mind of what Jesus Christ took me from. And I started to cry. That memory, it reminds me of what Jesus did in my life for Jeff. When I was 22 years old at that time, and he held that sin against me, never. And when I gave my life to him, just like Yolanda and Layla, when they gave their life to Jesus and says, I'm a Christ follower, Jesus, there's no condemnation in that. And I'll never forget. And as I remember, I start to cry because of what Jesus did. This woman, she starts to weep, the Bible says. And there, she starts to go as low as she can, and she grabbed his feet, and she put the perfume out, and she started to take her long hair and even wiped his feet. Wow. Here, the Bible says that she took that alabaster there in Luke 7, 37. She took that alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them, her, his feet. But then... There were those at the table that started to criticize. <laughs> oh, the one that started to criticize, Judas. Judas that betrayed Jesus. He was not a Christ follower. And right away, he starts to think of the money. Oh, that could be sold for the poor. Huh. How, 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 who is this woman? And then, then some were even thinking, does this man, Jesus, know who this woman is? She is the most sinful woman in our town. Jesus knew exactly who this woman was. And he knew that's why he, th those are the kind he came to this world for. Women just like that. Men just like that. Those that are the sinners of the worst sinners. I heard this just recently. It was interesting. I heard this from a pastor recently. And I, I thought, it's, it's so good because the same exact thing happened to me some years ago. I, I have this pain in my elbow. Right now I even have it. This pain in my elbow. I mean, extreme pain. And uh, some years ago I went to my chiropractor. I'm like, man, I don't know. Can you... Can you do something? I got a real bad pain. Why is the pain there? And he says, well, it's because the tension that's in your hand and you're gripping a hold of things too tight. And it's not up here, it's here. And every once in a while, I'll have to go in and he takes, man, my chiropractor, Todd Grubb there in, in K-Bag, awesome chiropractor. He takes... Um, like a vibrator machine and just vibrates it to, to shave that muscle down. And he says, you know, it's, you're gripping on to things too much or your, your tension when you're typing and so on. And I, I couldn't help, but just like that pastor said, how we grip on to things in life so tight, so tight. Some of you, <laughs> you're gripping on because you are so worried about tomorrow. You're gripping on to things so tight. Some of you are gripping on to your money so tight. Oh, because you gotta prepare, you gotta prepare. I wanna tell you, this virus should be showing us something. Who's in charge? 
President Trump is not in charge. Obama never was in charge, just like President Trump, just like uh, the Democrats or the Republicans. Nobody's in charge. There's one that's in charge. His name is Jesus Christ. There's only one that's in charge. You can watch the news all day long, and I encourage you not to. I encourage you to spend some of that time and a lot of that time on your knees, laying what you're grabbing onto so tight and laying in at the feet of Jesus. All three of those women, they knew where it belonged right at the feet of Jesus. What is that thing that you're grabbing hold of so tight? So tight. Maybe, men, maybe some of you were grabbing hold of an adulterous affair before this virus so tight, and because of this virus, you haven't been able to see that individual, but you're grabbing hold of it so tight, still wanting after this virus to be gone. But Jesus is saying, he loves you. He loves you. And he wants your marriage to be successful. Let go of that woman. Let go of her. Let go of that affair. Let go of that pornography. Let go of that lust. Let go of those bad feelings you have towards that person. And you're saying, "Uh uh-uh, they need to apologize to me. And you're holding on so tight that it's causing pain in your body somewhere else. And it's emotional pain that it's causing in your life. And it's bringing depression. It's bringing loneliness. It's bringing so much emotional pain because you're grabbing hold of that unforgiveness so much. Just lay it at the feet. Lay it at the feet. Every one of these women that were at the feet of Jesus, they first had to surrender before Jesus could do anything in their lives. And they grasped his feet. And they laid it at his feet. Today, I encourage you to lay it at his feet in the name of Jesus, whatever that may be. Tammy, do you have a word? Tammy had a word that was on her heart. I just feel that I was going to go on, but I feel that you need to share that. I, I was just really thinking this morning that the act of pouring out that alabaster box was an act of extravagant worship. And extravagant worship equips us for explosive warfare. Paul said to the Ephesian church, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. That word strong is in dynamo. It's it's the root of dynamite. It equips us for explosive battle. So I just wanted to encourage you this morning that When you kneel before him and you lay down the things you're clinging to and you grab a hold of his feet and you pour out that extravagant worship, while you're there, put on the full armor. Because the word says you do that so that you can take your stand. And when you get up, you're going to take your stand against the devil's schemes. The Lord gave me a new a new phrase for the acronym that's common to us. It's a mad, it's mad. We all know it's mothers against dr- drunk driving, but the Lord spoke to my heart this morning that mad for us now means mothers against demonic devices because we're going to be pouring out extravagant worship so that when we stand up, we have explosive warfare. And so I just want to encourage you that with that today. And you know what? It's not as important to me today that my children rise up and call me blessed as it is that they kneel down and call Jesus Lord. So let that be the prayer of our hearts as moms today. Let us be the ones to lay down and to grab hold of the feet of Jesus for the sake of our families, that they will too. Oh, that was good. That was just for you. That was just for you. I encourage everybody. I encourage, I I did this weeks ago and I encourage us to do it again. Everybody that's even in this audience, in this room, I encourage you to uh, kneel down. I encourage you in your house right now to kneel down. I encourage you to spend this time before God right now. Maybe you're not used to doing this. I encourage you as the husband right now, maybe 
you and your wife are watching and you haven't been in church forever, I encourage you, man, right now, just to take your wife's hand and, and just kneel down. Maybe it might be in that kitchen, might be in that living room. Doesn't matter. I encourage you just to do this and ask the Holy, I'm asking the Holy Spirit right now to stir and to convict you as he is convicting me right now. What is it that you need to lay down at Jesus' feet? What is it that needs to be laid down at his feet? Lord, I just thank you right now, dear Father, and I just pray over this audience. I, God, I pray that your mighty Holy Spirit, your mighty hand, God starts to tenderly convict us, tenderly stir in us. And dear Lord, as we're these are being obedient to you right now under God. They, they know what needs to be laid down at your feet. Dear Lord, it, maybe it's, maybe it's uh, drugs. Lord, as Yolanda talked about these, these things in our lives that want to destroy, maybe it's some alcohol. Just lay right now. Maybe it's pride of heart. That, Lord, that individual needs to humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways. That we just need to lay it at your feet. Maybe we're, it's these like Martha that have gotten so distracted with technology, so distracted with things around us, so distracted. And we just need to chill and be like a Mary and spend time at the feet of Jesus. And dear Lord, right now, we just do that. Dear Jesus, right now, if there's these that need to give their heart to you, dear Lord, I just pray in your name, God, that they will turn their heart to you. Dear Jesus, right now, in your name, they will give their lives to you. And if that is you, I encourage you to just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you for your cross. Thank you for the resurrection. And I confess to you, Lord, and I believe in you, Lord, as my Savior and as my soon coming King. And I give my whole life to you and I lay down my sins at your feet. Thank you, dear Jesus, for changing my heart and making me a new creation in your precious name. And everybody said, amen, amen.